Welcome back, folks, to the Wet Shivers Roundtable. This is episode 58, and what an episode it is, and what an episode it's already been. You should have seen what happened here in the green room earlier. It was fantastic. But we have a very, very special show for you today. My name is Douglas Smythe from phoenixartistsandaccoutrements.com, and with me as always, I have Scott Oster Miller, the clean shaver, wherever he is. And below, we have a guest host because David called in sick. We have Mr. Luke Webster with us today. Luke is of uh, from Blades Grimm, uh, straightrazors.com. What else you got going on, Luke, these days? Uh, just purchased classicshaving.com That's and right. uh, That's Heart right. Steel. Yeah, so we got Mr. Shaving himself with us as our, our special guest host today. And finally, uh, it, I, tonight we have a very, very special guest that I'm excited about, as well as all of you who are attending right now. We have Dr. John Charles, PhD. He'll be teaching us about grooming and shaving in space today. Um, John was uh, John I is and other things, hopefully, too, as well, NASA involved. He's the chief scientist of NASA's uh, human research program, responsible for shaping the scientific direction of research and development, enabling astronauts to go beyond low Earth orbit and eventually to Mars. Dr. Charles was previously the associate manager for the international science and led NASA's space life science planning for the joint U.S.-Russian year-long mission on the International Space Station and the Twin Studies. You know, and again, I know I speak for everyone. I say we're very excited and just honored to have you aboard with us today, uh, Dr. Oh, Charles. So welcome you. to the show. I'm, I'm looking forward. This will be a lot of fun. This yeah. will be. I mean, I, I got a chance to um, see uh, this presentation earlier a couple of weeks ago at a meetup in Houston, folks, and it was it was something else. I couldn't participate as much as I wanted to because I was pretty much working it. But uh, so it's great to have you here, John, uh, Dr. Charles, rather. And um, yeah, we'll be uh, doing your presentation first, and the guys in the peanut gallery will be asking questions as the show goes on. So uh, right. take take the mic, take it out. <laughs> what do you mean? Start Let's now. Second. Start now. Okay, cool. <laughs> Well, the topic, you know, of course, uh, and Doug, I'm sorry I didn't speak to you while you were here, but uh, I'm glad you guys, uh, I'm glad you invited me, and I was, I'm, I'm looking forward to talking to you. Uh, the topic is shaving in space, but that's just a subset of the whole being in space thing, the whole gestalt. And I, yes. I started off before, and I need to start off again by giving credit to the, to you guys, the taxpayers who make this all possible, and re remind you that we are your NASA, and we're your human research program, and you have charged us with understanding what it takes to send people to Mars. I am not about benefiting life on Earth. We got a whole other organization that benefits life on Earth from space research. Our charter is specifically, like Buzz Aldrin's t-shirt says, get your ass to Mars. And we're, <laughs> a, we're, a, we're about making that possible, not just once, so an astronaut can go to Mars and scuff up the dust with the toe of a boot and then come home and say, wow, it was great. We are about a program to send people to Mars consistently, repeatedly, successfully, and efficiently so we can learn what it's like, uh, what, what the environment is like on Mars, primarily in the search for life elsewhere in the solar system, but also just because uh, I think we all agree, it's not really a NASA's charter, but I think we agree that, that humanity ought to be a multi-planet species, and uh, powers that be have decided that Mars really ought to be one of the next stops. When you nice. go to Mars, it takes a long time to get there. It's, it takes at least six months to get to Mars, and that's with wow. that's with new propulsion techniques that don't exist yet. If we to use uh, chemical rockets like you see on the launch pad down at Kennedy Space Center right now, it's going to take eight or nine months to get to Mars. And when wow. you get to Mars, the launch window to return home <laughs> is just about closed. So when you get to Mars, you're probably looking at a layover of 18 months or so until the planets realign. And it really is just like the old song, you know, when the, when the moon aligns with Jupiter, it really has, the Earth has to realign with Mars so you can come home again. And then another, let's That's say, eight or nine months to come back. So we're looking at a round trip of at least two and a half and maybe even close to three years for every expedition to Mars. So it's not just there and back. 
And the fun thing is, is the second expedition will probably launch before the first expedition actually gets back to Earth. So they'll overlap a little bit in space as they're traveling, which will be... Wave out the window. Yeah. Okay. Question? Oh, yeah. Okay. Moon the other guys. <laughs> no pun intended. Yeah, you probably won't see them because you're going to be... Well, maybe you will. It's, space is big, though. It's hard to see somebody else out <laughs> That's there. That's true. <laughs> um, but uh, the thing is, I was originally concerned that there might a, might be a, a disconnect, you know, failure to learn lessons from the first time to apply to the second one. But with that amount of time, there are probably going to be an awful lot of communications back and forth saying, here, don't try this again the next time. Do something different, you know. Yeah. So when you, when you science the shit out of something, science it differently the next time. Exactly. But it's, we're talking about really long times in space. Human uh, exposures in space have not always been that long. Human in, exposures in space in the early days, back 50 plus years ago, were on the order of minutes or hours measured in orbits. It used to be that I would go to school in the morning and miss the launch, and I would come home in the afternoon and miss the splashdown because it all happened yes. in the course of a work day. You know, five hours was a a three orbit mission and a lot of yes. our early flights were that long but with uh and that was with the mercury project remember the mercury program remember alan shepard and gus grissom and oh, yeah. john glenn who was my inspiration for going into the space business and uh, wow. uh spoiler alert uh <laughs> listen it was probably about uh, 35 years later i actually got to work with john glenn on his shuttle mission so that was wow. that was karma you know i, I apparently wow. had lived a good life and for a little while there at least john glenn knew me by name so that was kind of that was kind of very, cool very, very cool. cool but early in the 60s uh space flights got longer because we had this wacky crazy idea of sending people to to the moon and a trip <laughs> to the moon takes three days and then a, a three-day trip back and if you're going to do something useful there you're going to be there for a couple of days and maybe even up to a week so a, a trip to the moon would gonna was going to be a minimum of eight days and maybe even up to two weeks for the Apollo program. So the Gemini program, which which succeeded Mercury, was intended to prove that people could fly in space and the spacecraft could hang together for up to two weeks, but not all at once. NASA didn't launch the first mission to uh, the first Gemini mission as a two-week mission. NASA launched first a three-orbit checkout flight, and then a four-day flight, and then an eight-day flight. And then the 14-day flight. So those are the, the progression. Three orbits, four days, eight days, 14 days. And if you look at the, if you look at the, the pictures I'm, I've, I've given you, I think it's figure one, actually, that says uh, this is what guys looked like when they got back from the early flights. And if you look at the, the pictures of the heroes on the aircraft carrier, it's a, it's a PowerPoint picture that I put together for the presentation you saw, Doug. And the title of it mm -hmm. is Some Didn't Shave in Space Because They Couldn't. But the, the guys that flew for four days and eight days and 14 days, when they're walking across the aircraft carrier looking extremely cool because they just yeah. gotten back from outer space, and they had beards because <laughs> nobody could shave on Gemini. Uh, I'll tell you right. a little bit about, a, about a, a little controversy that I've uncovered since my presentation that you heard, Doug. Oh. But uh, I will maintain that they didn't shave uh, on Gemini because they couldn't and because they had cold water, which would be uh, not much fun to shave. So anyhow, they, they got back for after their, their flights, and they, they were looking pretty, pretty, uh, pretty bearded. Uh, and this was also, as I, as I might have mentioned occasionally, uh, this is back in the days when beards were not really cool. This is back in the days when only, beard, only hippies had beards. You guys remember what a hippie was back in the day? So uh, these them. astronauts were all, <laughs> yeah. all white Anglo-Saxon Protestant males. They didn't really want to look like hippies, and so they shaved as quickly as they could on the aircraft carrier, which had plenty of hot water. And then they looked good thereafter. But early on in the space program, it was realized that comfort and hygiene would, would depend on things like shaving. And so NASA and the contractors, uh, being good engineers, said, well, there must be a way to take an electric shaver and make it work in space flight. And what is your problem in uh, shaving with electric shaver in space flight? Loose whiskers. Mm -hmm. In those early days of space flight, they were concerned oh, yeah. about the whiskers getting into the electronics and shorting yeah. out the reentry, you know, retro rockets and, and the, the radios and things like that. Yep. They had experience. Scary, yeah, they had experience on Mercury flights with, uh, especially on the longest one, which was a, a, over a day long. It turned out the astronauts' own perspirations and the, and the water vapor coming out of the exhalation 
started shorting out the electronics. So that's wow. that's kind of a scary place to be when you're waiting for retrofire and you're not sure if it's going to work because your own breath, yeah. your own condensate might be shorting it out. So Gemini was built better and Apollo was built better. They were much more sealed. They were conformal coated, you know, like electronics were sealed. But there were still other ways things could go wrong. So the engineers said, got to have a vacuum cleaner to suck up the loose whiskers. And it turned out that building a small shaver, a small electric shaver and a vacuum attachment to it was uh, was experimented with by several contractors. And that'll be my figure, too. Uh, that's that's the prelude to the Floby. Uh, yeah, very much like the Floby. And in fact, yeah, Meaning very it, much it like also the sucked. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the. Uh, it didn't, it didn't work, and it didn't work, and it was expensive, and somebody said it cost $5,000, and it never worked back in the day when $5,000 was real money. Yeah. Uh, but uh, So the first yeah, several Apollo really missions didn't, have, didn't shave either, and the astronauts came back and walked across the carrier deck looking like the, the bearded heroes they were. But then on Apollo 10, something funny happened. Apollo 10 was the, the last test flight before the moon landing. Apollo 10, as you, you may remember, Tom Stafford and John Young and Gene Cernan mm -hmm. uh, didn't get dirty on that flight. They didn't land on the moon, but they practiced landing on the moon. They went into orbit around the moon. They got into the lunar module. They went down to a very, very low orbit to the, to the point in the orbit where they should have been able to start the engine up again and then proceed to the landing, but they didn't. That was not their assignment. Then they then they rendezvoused and docked back with the uh, the command module and lunar orbit, and then eventually headed for home with their mission accomplished. And on the way home, they broke out the shaving cream and uh, the safety razor. <laughs> and for the first time in space, they shaved in space and shaved successfully. In fact, the code word for that was in the Air Force phonetic alphabet, Sierra Hotel Alpha Victor Echo. Because nobody Alpha, listening okay. on the radio would ever figure out what this Jeez. obscure code name was. So they told Mission Control, Experiment in Progress, Successful, and they took pictures. But they had an air-to-ground TV show later that, I think, that day or the next day on their last night in flight. And the, the astute observer would have noticed they were clean-shaven and not all, not all <laughs> fuzzy anymore. But they were the first yeah. crew to walk out on the aircraft carrier deck from the helicopter looking like they not looking like they'd been in space for a week. So yeah. after that, astronauts were able to shave in space and NASA continued also working on the electric shaver because, you know, some people just don't get the message. They want to have the electric and not the, the lather. So uh, NASA worked on that. And by the time Apollo 14 came along, they had a small uh, metal wind up electric razor or not even electric, but it was a mechanical razor that the astronauts used. And so you had your choice of, of both options for shaving in space. And thereafter, astronauts have been able to shave in space. The fun thing is on a few of the flights, especially in Apollo 11, uh, astronaut Mike Collins, who was the guy that stayed in orbit and didn't land, uh, if you refer to figure five that I've, I've sent you, Doug, um, mm -hmm. he actually grew his trophy mustache. You know, after several days of not shaving, he had acquired a nice mustache and he shaved everything else with the razor with the, you know, the shaving cream and the razor, except the mustache. And when he landed, he had a mustache that he had not launched with. So I thought that was kind of, you know, kind of a pirate look. And, and My uh, hero. The, the guy, yeah, the guy that was on the first crew to land on the moon, he was, like I say, the guy that stayed in orbit. The other guy is uh, Armstrong and Aldrin. Yeah, yeah. that's right. <laughs> the Armstrong and Aldrin. <laughs> <gets stuff>. <laughs> they, stayed, uh, they stayed clean shaven. Right. So if you look at all the Apollo astronauts that went to the moon, uh, the, the uh, and that's my figure... That's one of my figures. I'll I'll tell you which one it is later, but it's the uh, it's easy to tell. Let's see. Let's look at my figure eight. It looks like it's easy to tell who actually was able to shave in space because uh, they're before Apollo ten they were all bushy and after Apollo ten they were all clean shaven except for of course Apollo thirteen. You've right. seen that movie. They didn't have hot water. They didn't have a whole lot of time or inclination. So they oh, they yeah. also were not clean shaven when they landed back uh, in the ocean in the Pacific and were scooped up by the helicopter and brought to the aircraft carrier. But otherwise, uh, Apollo the Apollo astronauts were clean shaven, and that tradition continued on Skylab, which was America's first space station, except for a couple of guys that flew on the longest Skylab mission. And at that time, the longest Skylab mission was three months long. Wow. Uh, the three-month-long flight, two of the three guys said, you know what, we're going on a long trip. We're away from the family, just like a, a hunting trip, camping trip, so we're not going to shave. And they grew 
really cool looking big bushy beards nice. and that's going to be my figure 12 of doug that i sent to you uh, and so you can you'll be able to see that the uh, uh, jerry carr and bill pogue came back to earth and and looked like they'd been on a long trip ed gibson the other guy uh went ahead and shaved uh for because he liked to be clean shaven anyhow so uh that was the first time people actually landed with uh, beards when they had the option of not having beards. Other guys landed because they couldn't shave. They landed with beards. But these guys didn't uh, have the option. They just chose uh, not to shave. Uh, and there is sort of uh, – yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Charles, does hair grow at a different rate in space? You know, that's – I should know the answer to that. I'm going to say no. I'm okay. going to say it grows at a normal rate because your metabolism is pretty normal in space. But I should okay. have a better answer for you because, believe it or not, recently on the International Space Station, the Japanese have done hair clippings to look at the changes in the body's metabolism as captured in the hair. You know, forensics will look at your right. hair clippings and be able to tell if you've ingested toxins and, and things like that. <laughs> Yeah. And I should have asked the Japanese, does it grow at the same rate? But it didn't yeah. occur to me. I'll, 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 I just I'll noticed, find out. I noticed myself when I'm driving on a long road trip, I feel like my facial hair grows faster. Has anyone else yeah. noticed that? I, yeah, I think that's no. that's really okay, because you're not, you're not it, drinking it enough probably, water and your skin is shrinking. That's what it is. Yeah, I'll, I'll, Actually, that's brilliant. Yeah, that yeah. That's probably right there. Once upon a time back in uh, junior high, one of my teachers says, you know, uh, it's the old myth about your beard keeps growing after you're dead. And right. Yeah, I know the body. Yeah, the body is shrinking. It's not the beard getting Same longer. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. anyhow, uh, so I think it, you're not dead, obviously, Doug, but I think you're probably dehydrated. <laughs> Who knows what you were Thank drinking? God. <laughs> yeah. <no. laughs> but, uh, you know, the interesting thing is once once we got out of the 60s, people got a lot more comfortable with facial hair. And there was an astronaut, another astronaut who flew on the Skylab sp uh, space station for two months. And he launched with a mustache. He was the first astronaut that actually launched with facial hair. He was a civilian, uh, a civilian scientist. He's not one of the ex-military fighter pilots or, or test pilots. And he was just comfortable with facial hair. And he said, oh, that's what I'm going to do. And then along came the space shuttle era. In the space shuttle era, we had all sorts of civilians uh, running around as astronauts, including people that were what we called in those days payload specialists. And a payload specialist is a sort of a visiting scientist astronaut. He's sort of, you know, from another institution, but we ask him because his investigation is important to ask him to go ahead and fly the shuttle and execute that, ex that investigation. And one of those guys early in the space shuttle era was a, a naval, uh, a, an oceanographer who worked for the Navy, but he's a civilian. And his name is Paul Scully Power, hyphenated, Scully hyphen Power. He launched with a beard. The first time anybody had ever launched with a beard. And in wow. those days, that was a bit of a, a bit of a scandal, because number one, nobody had ever launched with a beard before. Oh my God, what does that mean? What is it going to make us look like in the eyes of the world? But he was another free spirit scientist, and he said, "No, I'm going to launch with my beard because why wouldn't I?" Yeah. But in those, yeah. But in those days, the helmets, the space helmets they wore for the early shuttle missions didn't seal at the neck and form an airtight seal around the neck. They sealed around the face. And the engineers were worried that he would not get a good seal where his beard was. Right. So he like said, great, mask. let's try it. So he tried it. It worked. And he said, okay, then I'm going to launch with my beard. And after that, another guy did uh, shortly thereafter. But as far as I can tell, there have only been two guys that have launched with beards. As far Two as beers. I can tell, lots and lots of mustaches and some really bushy mustaches like yours, Doug. You know, real handlebar mustaches. <laughs> they look like they're waxed. Yeah, but oh, only yeah. two beards, as far as I can tell, uh, which is really huh. kind of interesting. So since then, of course, shaving is just part of your everyday life in space. Uh, you shave in the morning if you're going to be on TV that afternoon or if you just like to shave and maybe you go for a few days or don't shave over the weekend. Uh, and it's... It's not as luxurious as uh, I shave in the shower, but it's not as luxurious as having lots and lots of hot water and, mm -hmm. and lots of warm towels and anything like anything. It's really a camping trip. Even today on the International Space Station, they use brushless uh, cream and they use, you know, just regular disposable razors. 
Astro and, Edge, right? Is it Astro Edge? Yeah, Astro Edge is a, is one of them. Yeah, it's Edge, or I mean, it's whatever you like. It's if you have a preference, they'll put that in your personal preference kit for you. Phoenix Iris <laughs> And Sorry, just, go on, John. <laughs> I mean, sometimes they, they will put the cream on and then they'll put water on afterwards to get the lather. And uh, maybe while they're at it, they'll just go ahead and shave the whole head because it's easy to take care of uh, all your shaving needs all at once. Yeah. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's just it's just part of, of routine life. Now, one the other topic that came up when you were here, Doug, and I didn't investigate further because I'm afraid to, is what about women shaving in space? Ah. Especially the parts, you know, that women shave. And I'm not going to go yeah. any further into that. Somebody asked me <laughs> once. Actually, I was talking about it with some of my colleagues at NASA, and somebody brought the question up, and we we agreed it's better. <laughs> He's frozen for you too. He's frozen. Yeah. Dr. Charles, you're frozen. Oh no! See, that's what happens when you talk about that stuff. Big Brother lost in cyberspace. <laughs> Better not to pursue that. Oh no! We we lost him. <laughs> I need to invite you back. Okay. Well, this has been this is a nice little break. This has been very interesting so far. Yeah. Uh, two, only two beards in space. Two beardos. Well, I love the fact that they figured it out because, I mean, especially for those extended trips, um, you know, being able to shave just makes you feel more human, you know, like it, it's yeah. over a long that period of time, <laughs> you know, it just helps you to feel more like a person than a test subject or a chimp, you know. But, <laughs> oh, this. But anywhere, anyways, folks. While we're waiting for Dr. Charles to get back, I just want to show you what I just recently acquired this week. And it's so fitting with this show being that uh, the United States works so closely with the Russians these days, more so than I, I just found out about this than I, I knew of. So, I mean, uh, it's quite amazing. So that said, I have this little piece of history I just picked up. Check this out. One second here. He says he's back. Oh, good deal. <laughs> this cosmonaut this is ah, this is my latest acquisition folks it's the russian version of pretty much the super slim well, adjustable. Or the slim adjustable uh, shave apparatus ideal this is the ideal and some of you have seen these or heard about these but check it out it's in between the same size oh it's in between a slim and a super slim but look at that very cool yeah, the bottom plate is plastic, however. But, you know, I used it this morning, and it gave a great shape. I used a feather blade. It did come with, fittingly enough for this episode, Sputniks. Sputniks. <laughs> <laughs> These blades are out of this world. No, uh, I haven't tried them yet, but uh, I'm very, very excited about this. So, oh, Dr. John can see us here. Okay, yeah, here let's exactly. try to get you back. Okay. Enough of this nonsense. But, yeah, if you guys, you know, collecting some, like, you know, Cold War era Soviet raises it's i think it's gonna be kind of a thing in the future very soon anyways they have so many really cool like relics over there that are direct ripoff of of gillette pretty much what russia was back then china is now you know mm -hmm. in regards to trademark and whatnot so uh no such thing as copyright these, if you can find one of these bad boys yeah pick one up they're really about 25 bucks and it's great shaver and just a piece of history so let's try nice. to get someone back in here <laughs> Kickstarter is giving China a run for their money. <laughs> so while we're trying to figure that out, uh, Luke, you had mentioned that you just acquired heartrazors.com or, or heartsteel. Heartsteel.com. So whenever <laughs> anybody buys a heart steel razor, that's you. Yep. Awesome. Yeah. So and we're and we're keeping the guys on in Michigan. They're great guys, and uh, we're excited about just ordered a ton more steel and a you know a ton more scales, and so we'll be ramping up that production there as well. Awesome. That's great. Congratulations yeah, thanks. on the expansion and acquisition. Thanks. That's really cool. Oh, yeah. No, Luke's a machine right now. He's on fire. I mean, you were also on a show. <laughs> we got to get Luke on for a full episode. But Luke, you were just on a show this morning as well, right? You were on GoDaddy. GoDaddy uh, yesterday morning. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we yesterday. did a podcast with them. 
Yep. That explains why I couldn't find it today. It was 11. I see. I knew all this stuff. It was the, a day late, a dollar short. Okay. So we got Josh. Yeah. Luke, tell us about the acquisition of a uh, classic shaving. Yeah. It's a really, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if any, you know, for the people that know Will and Danielle, great people. Um, they've ran a really solid business. Uh, classic shaving. I was really happy to, to make that deal happen. Um, we're excited. We want to do a, you know, uh, we're really excited about the ends that it gives us with being the U S reps for feather. Um, it's our goal to uh, really promote that brand heavily. Um, we have a couple of safety razors that are in production, um, that are built around some feather blades. And, uh, we're really excited about, you know, that key aspect. The other side would be the, uh, the pickup of heart steel as well. And, uh, then the classic brands like their soaps and shave creams, uh, you know, they're great products. And, uh, you know, we're just excited about having, and we, we actually just transferred everything from their Palm Springs office and warehouse to Idaho. So, um, yeah, just, it's a, it's going to be a great deal. And I'm really excited about making classic the, uh, kind of the kingpin for our grooming and sh our grooming sites. That's cool. Very cool. I was just Very looking cool. at classicshaving.com and I'm just, cruising around here seeing yeah we just just rebuilt the site uh got it off this terrible magento build and uh work working through that but it's going to be a lot better yeah so uh with the help from uh like godaddy and shopify and a couple other people we're gonna you know uh, really uh you know breathe a lot of life back into the to the site very cool so uh okay. yeah uh, it's good information about shaving in space you know the stubble is a uh, you know I, I just figured you know lather up and go for it right and that seems to be the the winner so wet shaving yeah. is the way to I go in space i want to you know broach that a little more is like what are they using for razors or uh, have they made the switch to cartridge do they have the option to use de's um and i'm okay. yeah no I, and the thing is now uh dr charles hasn't covered this yet but he's a wet shaver so Oh, awesome. and he's got influence. So I'm thinking if we just get on him a little, he might, you know, be bringing up one, you know, something, maybe a, a symmetry or something like that. You know, the purple hey. tip. I mean, that's just that it doesn't get much spacier than that. This that's is like getting cool. glowing glam. <laughs> but uh, no, I would, I would love to see some uh, some lather action up there too. Maybe not with a brush and, so and a puck of soap, but I want to see that, and I want to see some old school gear in play because well, they would use that. Yeah. Well, something I was thinking about earlier today was, you know, when I was in uh, when I was in Huntsville earlier this year, they were talking about, you know, everything that they do on on this uh, space shuttle or the space program is they're so 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 concerned about weight, um, yep. and so like you uh, know, recycling like their water and all that kind of stuff, they can only bring so much with them, and so I got thinking, oh, I, I know they don't weigh much, but like razor blades, replaceable blades, if they were to use like DE blades, um, could they do titanium? And because it would be lighter, but you know, yeah, I don't, it's going to add some expense. That. But I, I and maybe some blade experts here can can uh, give me some direction on this. But I was wondering, it would titanium, it would be a beast to to get that edge right. Or like a titanium straight razor, obviously, would be a really pain, huge pain in the butt to try and hone. But uh, if you were able to get a good edge on it, would it hold its edge longer because it's a harder metal or because it's a you know i don't know oh that's interesting possibly so gail's saying that they had the option to bring their preference of what they like to shave with Ooh. okay they still do i know back in the day he, he mentioned that but it, but be it electric or use a razor but i'm just currently wondering uh yeah, or aluminum an aluminum razor. you know split the weight difference by using an aluminum razor and regular de blades yeah 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 or a plastic DE razor. Yeah, plastic. You've seen those bad ones. Yeah. And then just yeah. throw in the DEs because they'll get more bang for their butt. <laughs> hey, bank a lot. I got to be careful there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, you do. I just don't like this. It. It's going to be YouTube for a while. Uh, this will be used against you. I just don't like the way of the bank light. That's, that's my only problem with them. I mean, they shave. Sure. Oh, you know, there's some there's some bakelites though that have they have some you know, a good feel to them. Of course, I'm a bakelite freak myself, yeah, but you are. there's some that really like it's just nice. It's not like plastic. It's really like it's got some you know heft to it. it. Yeah, yeah, it's got some heft. It's like it feels good in the hand uh, because bakelite's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but no, for a mission, I would love to see bakelite in space. You know, and it, and it actually, you know, it came up. Bakelite came up during the uh, 
air and jet industries when they were co uh, coming up at the same time at the turn of the last century, you know? So you wouldn't have one without the other. You, we wouldn't be where we are now if it wasn't for Bakelite. So to see it come back into use in such a way, cool. it, would be, it would be really fitting. Do you know, um, in 1942, was it 42? Yeah. The government was actually thinking of printing Bakelite pennies uh, oh. for the war. Oh, for the war. Yeah. 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 Instead of, but then they went with steel, oh, steel. instead. But it was, it was very, very close. Uh, but I mean, it was used for everything. Bakelite coffins, even Bakelite bullets. Um, stuff's magical. Yes. If you could re register with the code name Alpha Victor Echo, that's Alpha Victor Echo. <laughs> I will get you back in here. <laughs> we, got my go on on back. we can get him back. Whoa, what just happened to Luke? Luke's... Oh, you walked around? around. I want to go turn off this overhead light. It's so heavy on my head. Like yeah, you can see the sunburn. Like, <laughs> there we go. Houston, we have a problem. Exactly. Okay. What else we got out there, guys? Any questions or concerns about anything going on right now? Um, Let's see. Questions in the. Oh, we do have some questions. There's one to you, Luke. Okay. Uh, Let's see. The question is, you mean the Feather Kai single edge style blades like for Feather Artist Club Razors? I guess this goes back yeah. to. Okay. Well, that was easy. Yeah. And... yeah we're go My goal is to create a, a couple different lines around those and in the D in the dual edge blades as well. But I like the, uh, the idea of the, the single edge type injector style. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As do I. Uh, Space-based post-shave products. That's interesting. Space some based. lotions. Yeah. Aftershave lotion or gel. Sure any of that stuff would, would work. Make a little pre-shave lotion. That's shaving technology advanced. Wonder if they... speaking in space. Hmm. Well, I'd say it's advanced for space. I don't think we're utilizing any of those advancements down here because we don't need to. But that's not. I wonder why. though, like if. They, uh, you know, if it's impacted Gillette or anything like that, like if they've done any joint research kind of stuff um, between the two companies. I wouldn't doubt it. I mean, they, they set up a lot of stuff for testing to the space station and so on and so forth. Yeah. There is. Okay. I'm seeing a problem here. Okay. Okay. He is, he's going to do it. Alpha Victor Echo. He's coming in. Okay. Great. I, yeah, that's a that's a really good question, and one we should pose the good doctor once he returns. But I have my uh... clearly, I'm a fanboy, and I'm not letting anything bring me down today. Yet we're, we're, it's a little wonky here. This is our first glitch, figures, but you know I, I'm having a good time. Uh, I know Luke's having a good time. Look at him; he's clearly having okay. a good time. But uh, so three margarita lunch. I come back and I <laughs> yeah. gotta do this. It's good. Yeah, he, he, he does a liquid <laughs> lunch, uh, and I respect that. Okay, GI James is having a good time. So, any other questions out there, folks? That we can, uh, I guess, now is the time to build up some questions. So, when the doctor gets back, he can answer them uh, and finish his presentation. Looks like we're going to run over a, a few minutes uh, today, if that's cool with everybody. Hold on, let me just check with my wife. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Hold on, let me just check with your wife. He <laughs> <laughs> just. Finished. Let's see. Yeah, you know why, Steve Hardy? It's because he's in Houston. They, it's, it's communication problems galore over there. <laughs> I'll tell you what, though. I did learn something uh, while I was in Houston just a couple weeks ago, is that no matter where a launch takes off in the United States, once it's, I think, 10 miles above the Earth's atmosphere or above the Earth, then it goes right to Houston. Then they immediately start communicating with Houston. Houston takes, takes over the transmission. Um, Very cool. Yeah, I thought that was really cool. And, you know, and we also have an exchange program with Russia. We have um, some of our NASA guys over there, and we have some of their cosmonauts over here. So a lot of NASA guys are studying Russian right now. It's really – in fact, that hat that I was wearing, um, which is called an Ushanka, I believe, um, was a gift from my friend Stephen Timms, who works for NASA – or works for the sp uh, space industry. But, uh, yeah, they do a lot of work in Russia. Russia gets the job done. They're, they're good at certain things, and we're good at certain things. So it's really just a, a trade of a uh, technology almost. Cool. Not that, you know, trading secrets, but they they do they trade off. You know, they'll send the rest of the piece to Russia. They'll finish it there, or refine the job, and then send it back. Okay, I am looking for Alpha Victor Echo. Okay, 
we're going to roll like this then. Dr. Charles, I'm sorry, but I can't see you. So what we're going to do is just we're going to take some questions from the audience. And if you could answer them um, in the sidebar, we'll read the answers. But, you know, we're going to have to get him back on or get you back on a future show. Dr. Charles, I'm sorry for all the glitches here. I don't know what's going on. This has never happened before. Uh, so, okay, excellent. He will partake in the question and answer format. So let's move along. People, if you have any questions, put them down below as opposed to the right sidebar. And uh, for Dr. Charles, he will be answering them. Somebody asked, so is the electric shaver Matt Damon uses in on Mars in The Martian, uh, is that inaccurate? I wouldn't think so because he's on Mars when he does it. You know? So, I mean, <laughs> if it's similar gravity to ours, then it wouldn't be, if he, as long as it's on Mars, it wouldn't be a problem, but. That's interesting. What, what do you have to say about that, Dr. Charles? Was the electric shaver that Matt Damon used on yeah. Mars, the Martian film, inaccurate? Gravity isn't an issue for an electric shaver. There we oh, go. Okay. Well, and what else we got? Uh, okay, here's the one that we were talking about as you were uh, changing your name. Uh, Dr. Charles, has shaving technology advanced from it being used in space? <laughs> he also said the Martian is set in the future, so they can do whatever they want. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Futurist. They got to figure it out. Although I got to say, while he's typing that, uh, I was really genuinely impressed with that movie just because they, like, from what I understand, the author that wrote that book actually checked with several space engineers and, like, said, hey, is this what would actually happen or what it would actually be like? And, and Smart. They, as far as they could tell, everything that, that he wrote in the book would, would have been accurate as far as they know. Um, Very cool. Yeah, it's funny, like, when art imitates life and life imitates art, because I feel like the NASA borrowed a lot from Kubrick. And now you see them going back. Now these guys are going to NASA for it. So it's like this, this interesting interplay, if you will. Except for the triples. <laughs> <laughs> Those are troublesome. Yes, they are. Um, he said, no, same technology as Earth. Astronaut preference. Uh, hopefully we'll see. <laughs> the triples. Martin, uh, so, Dr. Charles, we were also talking when you were gone, is, uh, are, are any of them using DE razors up there, or safety razors, or even straight razors? Do we have any heroes at, from the wet shaving community up there? <laughs> yeah, I think Kubrick inspired some of the some of the gear. <laughs> no straight razors. No straight razors. Just, just, okay, so he says there's no straight razors being used, just disposables. So it, it's, it's no longer optional for the astronaut. Or cosmonaut, or maybe it's just the option between the disposables and the electric disposables. Or is it like just like Gillette throwaway disposables, like the entire plastic razor? Or are we talking about disposable blades, reusable blades, or like a replaceable? Okay, so, yeah, disposable or electric. Well, that's a bummer. Blades, now, now being a wet shaver yourself, Doctor Charles, do you have any influence over these guys? Can we get the DE back there? Maybe a uh, a Bakelite <laughs> DE uh, razor. No influence. <laughs> Is there a way to gain influence? <laughs> sure. Large donation. The address of all the, yeah. all the astronauts and Douglas, you send them free shaving stuff and see if we can. <laughs> Luke and I can do this. We can. We can. We can make this happen. We can fill we up can that space. Do that. We're telling astronaut what to do. <laughs> I'll deliver them myself. I don't care. <laughs> I got the jumpsuit on. I'm ready. Uh, let's see. Um, one I'm question was asked: face-based post-shave products. So, like any aftershave balms, or I, I would think maybe like a salve that they could have in a tin that they can just like it's a bit more solid that they can you know, rub in their hand and put on their face. Maybe. Yeah, that makes sense. Like well, you know, even before cream that, someone's, okay. yeah, cream is, did they ever, ever, I mean, I'm pretty sure they probably didn't, but lather, use a brush and soap, it's probably a bloody mess, so cream was probably always used, I'm guessing. No brush. No brush. No brush. Yeah. Now, that's interesting. I wonder if we can make a, like a magnetic brush or something like, you know, with nanotechnology that would hold the lather in until you hit your face with it. 
Luke, I want you to get on that. Loose bristles. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> But I want a piece of it. Okay, it'll, Luke. it'll shed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you look shaving my hand. Yeah, this has been a wacky show so far, folks. We're truly lost in space on this episode. Elon Musk can manufacture it. Yeah, there you go. Like the yeah, well, Tesla. Right? I mean, this won't shed. That's a, right. That's a good brush. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, what I'm thinking of is static. Uh, well, you probably don't want static electricity on board anything up there. Nope. Yeah. Never mind. But it is a good brush. <laughs> this is a good brush. Anybody out there looking for an inexpensive synthetic brush? Seriously. Way to go. Good, good brush. Well, Dr. Charles, so while we still have you on, on board, uh, so to speak, what is NASA looking at right now aside from Mars? Like, what's our next step? I mean, I, I just saw some recent photos and whatnot. I mean, it, it reminds me of the 80s, actually, the buzz that's going on out there. I feel like the 90s was like, I, I NASA? We didn't know it, no, it still existed. I remember the 80s, it was like, you know, it was it Tang, uh, Charleston Chu, Punky Brewster even wanted to be an astronaut. We all wanted to be astronauts, and I wanted to be an astronaut. Then something happened in 1986, I think, that we kind of turned us off. And the Challenger, uh, or that was the Challenger. But, um, and so the 90s, there was a few setbacks there, too. So we didn't talk about NASA that much. But now the buzz is back. We're all getting hyped up again. It's exciting. So what? Are, okay, here we go. The next step is moon orbit. While commercial companies take over Earth orbit. That's very interesting because I did hear that there is a commercial company that's got permission to send a robot up to the moon. I don't think they have permission for the flight yet, but they got a permission to send the robot up there. Do you know anything about that, Doc Charles? <laughs> and each, I've heard that there were companies that were want that were like wanting to offer people the ability to go and orbit the Earth. Travel. Vir was that Virgin? Yep. Was yep. Yeah. Virgin Galactic. Yep. Commercial company has permission for lunar lander as a challenge. So, like, uh, as okay. a, I, we dare you to do this <laughs> kind of a thing. They like reward them. There's like a million dollar reward yeah. or something or for, for, for like any private person that puts something into orbit. And you, you see like uh, Elon Musk, uh, right. you know, like Virgin Galactic. And then uh, what's the guy, Paul Allen from uh, Microsoft. They're all, they all have uh, ambitions for this private sector space race. I think Google is talking about doing something. Yeah. XPRIZE. Well. Yeah. Uh, now what about the elevator to the moon? And I'm not joking. This has been talked about. What, what's your take on that? Alpha Victor Echo. Ele elevator oh, is very, very cool. I remember this being oh, talked about. Willy Wonka. Time when they were elevator. I don't know if it was glass or not. I think, but it was something. They were actually talked about. It. Uh, requires new carbon fiber technology. Space elevators with carbon nanotubes. Yeah, there you go. Hmm. No, that's very interesting. So I just want to make sure I got the, the code word right for uh, I just shaved in space, Dr. Charles. Is it Sierra Hotel Alpha Victor Echo? Or did I make up that part, the Sierra Hotel? <laughs> okay, it is that. <laughs> Excellent. I'll be using that in the future for something. <laughs> there you go. Sierra Hotel well, you know, Alpha. That, that's the name for a new, a new PAA soap. There you go. I, well, I'm thinking of incorporating into everyday life. Fr my girlfriend and I, we have this. Code like if I can't remember someone's name and they're coming up to me and I'm I, I cough twice to let her know that I don't remember their name so she'll introduce herself first to them and I get their name and I'm just like oh I'm sorry Don I I just thought you were always sick <laughs> <laughs> well no longer now I'm gonna be like Sierra Hotel Alpha Victor Echo and she'll know immediately to introduce sense. herself that, now I totally understand why were you, why you were coughing so much at Big Shave West. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I said I told everyone I had walking pneumonia. You know, it's really I, I just have a horrible, horrible memory. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it, it isn't a great trick. It works every time. They they never get it. And I just apologize for being rude. Oh, I'm sorry, Don. I I'm just very. I was rude. I you know. WTF? Yep, their favorite <laughs> whiskey tango fox. The cop. Yeah, nice. Doctor Coldfinger there, GI James. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I'm reading these comments. You know, for our viewing audience, after the fact, watching the edited version at home right now, they're very confused what's going on. But what I can say is, you've missed one hell of a show today. I'm having a great time, and I've been look really looking forward to this. It didn't pan out the way I wanted it to exactly, but uh, it, was, it was really great to have uh, Dr. John Charles 
uh, with us today on the show. And we will have to invite you back, uh, John, to really pick your brain. We typically don't have any any glitches. This has been a great platform yeah. up until now. <laughs> it's been uh, maybe I should title this Houston. We have a problem <laughs> in the playback. Hey, no, I don't think I don't know what's going on, but yeah, we'll definitely well, do something again as we, you know, as we we boldly shave where no man has shaved before. Uh, no, that that just sounds wrong. But as we boldly go where no man. Has, <laughs> but I do want to see uh, how it progresses. I mean, are, are we are we done? I guess this is my last question: is Are we done developing the the gear we're using currently uh, on the space station to shave with? Are they, I mean, is it got it done? Is it got it right the first time, so to speak? Is there any need for improvement or reason to improve upon? No new developments. And it's been pretty much static but since the 80s, I'm imagining, when cartridge razors came into the, the fold. Just use it. Yeah, just use it and move on to the next thing. Right. Well, I don't know if I'm. I don't find this too encouraging anymore. To, to... Again, I'll deliver it to the space station. Just point <laughs> me in the direction. That way. Maybe. Yes. Well, maybe commercial providers. Will... Yeah. Okay, Luke, we need to form a think tank. Is that's a challenge. Yeah, that, that's a challenge. That's the challenge we've been waiting for. Mars yeah. right there. <laughs> Three points. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, folks, we come to the end of the hour, and it has been a highly entertaining, if not educational, episode of the Wet Shavers Roundtable. Um, we don't let anything bring us down. Uh, on our panel today, we have Luke Webster of Glen <laughs> Grimm's Blades, as well as StraightRazors.com. And you know, I just I, I I need a list of everything you're about right now, Luke. <laughs> but I'll I'll have links below. Uh, we also have. Scott Oster Miller, the clean shaver, as almost always. And I myself am Douglas Smythe from phoenixshaving.com. Uh, we will see you next week in episode 59 of the Wet Shavers Roundtable. I believe we'll be checking in with a, a barber school. Um, I hope that to happen. If not, Luke will be back and we'll be picking Luke's brain on wet shaving <laughs> and what he's up to. If that's okay with Luke. <laughs> it's totally fine. Okay, we might have Luke then. I think it's going to be Luke. Excellent. Thank you all for joining us, and thank you all for your patience today, and thank you all for your great questions. It's you, the audience, our live, interactive on the lifeblood of the show, and yes. keep it flowing and moving along, and pretty uh, entertaining, I must say. I've been reading some of the comments today. You guys, you have a great attitude, especially during the glitches. So thanks a lot for joining us, folks, and we'll see you next week on the Wet Shavers Roundtable. Until then, shave on! <laughs> Save it up, everybody. Save